I hope you are enjoying your online sessions. I'm going to continue yesterday's session, which was on nutrition in plants. Let's have a quick recap of what you have learned yesterday. Today. You have learned that nutrition is a process in which living organisms take in food and utilize it for energy, growth, and development. And there are two types of nutrition. One is autotrophic nutrition, and the second one is heterotrophic nutrition. Autotrophic nutrition is the process or the type of nutrition in which organisms prepare their own food. Examples, green plants, algae, and green bacteria. Heterotrophic nutrition is, it is a type of nutrition in which organisms cannot make their own food. For example, non-green plants, humans, and animals. Autotrophic nutrition. Green plants have autotrophic nutrition or perform autotrophic nutrition by photosynthesis. And you are very familiar with this word photosynthesis. You have learned in class six also children. It is a process in which green plants prepare their own food using carbon dioxide and water in the presence of chlorophyll and sunlight. And it takes place in leaves. So only leaves are known as kitchen of the plant. Now the equation of photosynthesis is 6CO2 plus 6H2O will give you in the presence of chlorophyll and sunlight C6H12O6 which is glucose and 6O2 is released. Then this is the picture diagram showing photosynthesis. What all are essential for photosynthesis? Carbon dioxide and chlorophyll, sunlight and water. And from where do we get all these? And you have also seen the structure of stomata. There are two bean-shaped god cells which will help in opening and closing of the stomata, which will enable the gaseous exchange. Stoma is the pore, which is uh, uh, when there is, when uh, if the plant needs oxygen during uh, performing of photosynthesis, stomata or stoma will open. You can see two pictures here opening of the stoma as well as in the second picture you can see the closing of stomatal pore or stoma. Yes, Julie. Now the conditions required for photosynthesis. What are they? You have seen as you have seen in the equation. Carbon dioxide and water are required but in the presence of sunlight and chlorophyll. So, how many things are required for photosynthesis? For example, carbon dioxide, water, sunlight, and chlorophyll. Chlor uh, carbon dioxide is taken from air through stomata, and water from soil through roots. Chlorophyll is a green pigment which is present in leaves. You are already familiar with the equation, children? Now, today we are going to perform or do some activities uh, through which we'll prove that carbon dioxide is essential and sunlight is essential and chlorophyll is essential. First, we will go with uh, carbon dioxide. We will prove that carbon dioxide is necessary for photosynthesis. For this, you need to take a potted plant and a bottle, a bottle with a wide mouth, which is and a cork is inserted. Cork is nothing but a lid like thing, and it is split in between, in the center, so that to keep the leaf through the slit. Then a 5 ml of 5 to 10 ml of KOH, that is potassium hydroxide, 
is put in the bottle. In your textbook, it is given as caustic potash. It is the same. And why do we put KOH in the bottle? It will absorb carbon dioxide. So this setup, first of all, the plant is kept in dark for two days. Why is it kept in dark? So that photosynthesis do not occur and whatever starch is present in the plant is used up. Then the entire setup as shown in the figure is kept in sunlight. After some time, the leaf is separated from the plant and tested for starch. How to test for the starch? You have already know that the reagent which is used for starch is iodine. But while performing starch test in uh, photosynthetic activities, we will follow a procedure. First, the leaf which was kept in the bottle, half which was kept in the bottle is taken and it is boiled in water. Why do we boil in water? To kill the cells and make the leaf soft. Then it is then boiled in alcohol. We boil in alcohol to remove the chlorophyll. You, and you should note here children that chlorophyll is insoluble in water but soluble in alcohol. So uh, this uh, is also known as bleaching. Then uh, it is uh, now the leaf again after boiling in alcohol again it is put in water dipped in water so that the alcohol which is stuck to the leaf will be removed. Now it is ready for starch test. You can drop a uh, drop, few drops of iodine solution on the leaf. Then you will observe that the part of the leaf which was inside the bottle will not turn into blue-black and the part of the leaf which is outside the bottle will turn into blue-black. What does this prove? It proves that photosynthesis occurred outside the bottle but not inside the bottle. Why? Because it did not receive carbon dioxide. We have kept caustic potash inside the bottle, which absorbed the carbon dioxide. This proves that carbon dioxide is necessary for photosynthesis. I will repeat again. First, take a potted plant, keep it in dark for two days so that starch is used up and this is called de-starching. Then we will take a wide mouth bottle which is having a split cork and the leaf is inserted in such a way that half of the leaf is inside the bottle and half is outside the bottle. Now in the bottle we have already taken 5 to 10 ml of KOH. What is KOH? Potassium hydroxide or caustic potash. Now, this setup is kept in the sunlight for some time. Then, the leaf is separated. I forgot to tell you one thing, children. The lid or the cork is also uh, sealed with Vaseline. Not, uh, so that any entry of air is prevented. Then this setup is kept in sunlight. Afterwards, the leaf is taken and then tested for starch. How do we test for starch? First, we'll boil in water to kill the cells and make the leaf soft. And then it is boiled in alcohol to bleach or to remove chlorophyll. As you know that chlorophyll is soluble in alcohol but not in water. Then few drops of iodine solution 
are put on this leaf, you will observe that the part of the leaf which was inside the bottle did not turn bluish black, indicating that there was no photosynthesis on that part of the leaf. And the part of the leaf which was outside, it showed blue-black, indicating that it uh, there was uh, it uh, underwent photosynthesis. Next, to prove that to prove that chlorophyll is essential. To prove that chlorophyll is essential for photosynthesis. Now, you all know that chlorophyll is a pigment present in leaves, green pigment. It is responsible for the green color of leaves. It is present in a specialized cell organelles known as chloroplast. The chloroplast, as I told you, they are cell organelles and they are disc shaped. They are disc shaped bodies. In order to prove that chlorophyll is necessary for photosynthesis, we will take a variegated leaf. Hope you have seen many croton children, with, which, uh, along with green color, they, will, they show spots of light yellow color or white in color. So, the leaf which is having green, green parts along with the non green plants. blue black and the part of the leaf which was white or light yellow in color did not turn blue black. What does it indicate? This indicates that photosynthesis occurred only in that part of the leaf which was green in color. This proves that chlorophyll is essential for photosynthesis. And I will repeat again children. A variegated leaf is taken. Variegated leaf is a leaf which has green parts as well as non-green plants, uh, non-green parts. You, uh, usually these type of, this type of leaves are seen in crotons. So this leaf is taken and tested for starch. And it was observed that the part which is green in color only turned to blue black. The rest of the leaf, which was light yellow or white in color, did not change its color to blue black. What does it indicate? It indicates that chlorophyll is essential for photosynthesis. Then children, how will we prove that sunlight is essential for photosynthesis? We have to take the setting for, again, we have to take the same setting as we have taken for carbon dioxide. The potted plant, wide mouth bottle, uh, slit, split cork. Only thing is, the bottle should be wrapped with black color paper, white black color paper. It will not allow the light to pass through into the bottle. It will not allow the entry of light into the bottle. Now, the potted plant, again, the leaf is inserted through the split cork into the bottle. Now, half of the leaf is inside the bottle and half of the leaf is outside the bottle. And the potted plant is kept in sunlight for some time. Later, Children here, as we do not take KOH, we are not testing for carbon dioxide importance. We are testing here the necessity of sunlight. So we will keep this setup in sunlight for some time. 
Then after some time, the leaf is separated from the plant and tested for starch. It was observed that after boiling in water to kill the cells, then boiled in alcohol to remove the chlorophyll, then iodine drops were put on the, uh, should be put on the leaf. It was observed that the part of the leaf which was inside the bottle did not turn to blue black and the part of the leaf which was outside the bottle turned to blue black. This indicates that in the bottle there was uh, photosynthesis did not occur. Photosynthesis occurred outside the bottle, the part of the leaf which was outside the bottle. I will repeat the uh, activity children. Take a potted plant and a wide mouthed bottle, fit a splitted cork to the mouth of the bottle and insert the leaf through the splitted cork in such a way that half part of the leaf is inside the bottle and half is outside the bottle. And important thing here is the bottle is wrapped with black paper so that no light enters into the bottle. This setup is put in sunlight for some time and later the leaf is taken and tested for starch. It was observed that the part of the leaf which, is, which was in the bottle did not turn to blue black and the part of the leaf which was outside the bottle turned to blue black, which indicates that for photosynthesis, sunlight is also essential. The part of the leaf which was inside the bottle received all other essential materials which are required for photosynthesis. For example, it received carbon dioxide, it received water, and it had chlorophyll, but, sorry, it didn't receive light because we have wrapped the bottle with black paper. Except sunlight, it had everything. So it didn't, uh, photosynthesis did not occur. Now, we will prove that oxygen is produced during photosynthesis. There is an activity till now we have discussed what all are essential for photosynthesis. We have seen that carbon dioxide, without carbon dioxide, photosynthesis will not occur. Without water, it will not occur. Without sunlight, without chlorophyll. Now, we are going to prove that as a result of photosynthesis, along with the glucose, oxygen is released. How to prove that? For this, we have to take a bunch of uh, twigs of hydrilla plant. Hydrilla is a hydrophyte, it is an aquatic plant. So the twigs of hydrilla plant are kept in a beaker which is filled with water to its half. Then on the twigs, a funnel is kept placed on the twigs and a uh, test tube is inverted on the stem of the funnel and this setup is put in sunlight for some time. After some time, you notice that gas bubbles will come out of the stem of the funnel and go into the test tube. You have to take the test tube out and bring a burning splinter. You, have, you will observe that it will burn with a bright flame. This indicates that oxygen is released during photosynthesis. You all know that oxygen is the only gas which supports combustion. I will repeat this activity again, children. 
the activity was to prove that oxygen is produced during photosynthesis for this we have taken twigs of hydrilla plant on the and these twigs are placed in a beaker containing water on the twigs funnel is kept and on the stem of the funnel a test tube is inverted this setup is kept in sunlight for some time after some time you will notice that gas bubbles will come out of the stem of the funnel and enter into the test tube and you will take the test tube slowly and test for the gas involved you will bring a you have to bring a burning splinter near the mouth of the test tube and you will see that it will burn it will burn with uh, brightness that means the gas that is involved is helping in combustion is supporting in combustion and we all know that oxygen oxygen is the gas which supports combustion now children yesterday you have learned about two types of nutrition one is autotrophic nutrition till now we have discussed about autotrophic nutrition what is it it is a type of nutrition where organisms prepare their own food and now we are going to see what is heterotrophic nutrition heterotrophic nutrition it is a type of nutrition where um, organisms cannot make their own food cannot prepare their own food in our uh, heterotrophic nutrition again there are four types of nutrition number 1 is parasitic nutrition parasitic nutrition is a type of nutrition in which non green plants live in or on green plants for their food so they depend on other plants though they are plants they cannot perform photosynthesis so they will depend either completely or partially on other plants for example cascata cascata will twine around the stems and take the nutrition from the stem of the host we call the plant which is giving support in the form of shelter or food is known as host plant okay so the host plant will provide nutrition and shelter for the parasite the one which is dependent is known as parasite the one the plant that is providing food and shelter is known as host so this uh, for example dodder or cascata it is also known as amar bale children so cascata is a total parasite that means it completely depends on the host plant it will not prepare its food at all so how will it take uh, the food from the host it develops sucker like things known as hostoria roots root like uh, uh, structures known as hostoria with the help of hostoria the uh, the the cascata or the parasite will draw food from the host so when it is getting ready made food from the host why will it prepare food it will not prepare food it takes ready made food from the host and live it is a total parasite what kind of nutrition was it it is a parasitic nutrition and parasitic nutrition is a type of heterotrophic 
nutrition. What is parasitic nutrition, children? Nutrition in which non-green plants live in or on the green plants to take food for their food. They are dependent for their food. So the one, the organism or the plant which is providing food is known as host and the organism which is taking food or help from the host is known as parasite. Example for parasitic nutrition is cascata or daughter or it is also known as amarbane and mistletoe is also example of parasitic nutrition. Cascata is total parasite children and mistletoe is partial parasite. It is known as partial parasite because only to some extent it is dependent on the host. In case of daughter, totally it is dependent on the host. So it is a total parasite. Next type of nutrition is saprophytic nutrition. The nutrition, what is it? Saprophytic nutrition. It is a type of nutrition obtained from dead and decaying plants or animals. For example, fungi, Indian pine and neusia. So what do they do? They release certain enzymes which digest the um, uh, dead and decaying organisms and they get nutrition from this. So these are known as saprophytes and the type of nutrition is known as saprophytic nutrition. What is it? Saprophytic nutrition. Nutrition obtained from dead and decaying plants or animals is called saprophytic nutrition. For example, fungi. And in fungi, what are all are included children? Mushroom, bread molds, yeast. You know, you, I think you are familiar with bread molds. You keep a piece of bread aside and you see after, you observe after three to four days. Okay, white or greenish, white color thing or greenish little will be noticed. What is that? It is nothing but fungi. Okay, it is known as bread mold. So mushroom, bread mold and yeast are examples of Fungi. Another examples are other examples are Indian pie and Neosia. So what do they do? They extract their food. They obtain their nutrition from dead and decaying plants or animals. So they are known as saprophytes. And the type of nutrition is said to be saprophytic nutrition. Next coming to another type of nutrition, we will see this type of nutrition in insectivorous plants. What are these children? Insectivorous plants, we can also call them carnivorous plants. These are autotrophic plants that feed on insects to supplement their nitrogen requirement. What is the meaning of this? There are certain plants which grow in areas which are deficient in nitrogen. The soils which are deficient in nitrogen. In India, such type of soils we find in Bihar. Okay, so for this supplement, for this nitrogen, for these supplements, these plants are dependent on insects. As you know, living organisms contain nitrogen in them. Okay, so to get nitrogen, these, depend, these plants are dependent on insects. I think you are familiar with the pitcher plant. You might have heard the name pitcher plant. Okay, pitcher plant, Venus flytrap, bladder wart or utricularia, and sundew. 
In all these plants, you will see that the leaf is modified in such a way that the insect is trapped and the nutrition is taken from the insect. For example, in pitcher plant, the leaf is modified into a pitcher. Pitcher is a bag-like thing, a sack-like thing. And at the one end of the pitcher, you find the lid. And in the pitcher, downward facing hair-like structures are present. How these hair-like structures are useful, children? As the insect sits on the rim of the pitcher, the lid will close. So the insect cannot escape from the pitcher. And the downward facing, uh, facing hair-like structures, which are present at the bottom of the pitcher, will not allow the insect to go out. They get trapped in the hair-like structures. Then it is killed, it gets killed, and the nutrition is taken from the insect. So this is about pitcher plant. In Venus flytrap, the leaf is in the uh, form of uh, flaps, two flaps, which are joined by a hinge-like structures. As the insect sits on the flap, immediately the flaps are closed so that the insect is killed. So all these are mechanisms to trap the insect. So we find such type of mechanisms in insectivorous plants. Another example is sun dew. In sun dew, you will see that in sun dew, uh, sticky substance is present as the uh, insect sits on the flower, on the, this uh, sun dew, immediately the sticky thing will trap the insect. It will not allow the insect to escape. So you have seen a variety of mechanisms to trap the insects. I repeat, insectivorous plants are autotrophic plants that feed on insects to supplement their nitrogen requirement. So will, is, uh, uh, will they undergo photosynthesis? Is photosynthesis seen in these plants? Yes, of course. What is the food of the plants? It is glucose. So it prepares, its, I, I mean the glucose is then converted to starch. So to prepare its food, it will undergo photosynthesis. So this will depend, these plants will depend on insects only to get that additional supplement which is lacking in the soil. What is that additional supplement? It is nitrogen. So these insectivorous plants grow in nitrogen deficient soils. As I told you, in our country, it is in Bihar. Some places in Bihar are uh, deficient in nitrogen. So what are the examples of insectivorous plants? Pitcher plant, Venus flytrap, utricularia, and sundew. Next one is symbiotic nutrition. Symbiosis means association of two individuals for mutual benefit children. For example, you will help your friend when he or she is absent. And in turn, when you are absent or when you need help, your friend will help you. So this is called symbiotic association, wherein both the organisms are benefited. What type of association did we see in that side? Where the two individuals or the two organisms benefited from each other? No. In parasitic nutrition, we have seen that only parasite is having benefit, not the host. Okay, children? Now, we'll see the symbiotic nutrition. It is 
interdependence or mutual association of two organisms in which both the organisms are benefited from each other for example last year you might have learned in uh, modification of roots some roots will perform they help in trapping the nitrogen for example rhizobium bacteria you might uh, you are familiar with the word rhizobium isn't it children so where is this rhizobium bacteria present it is present in the root nodules of leguminous plants what are these leguminous plants for example all pulses pea groundnut all these plants are leguminous plants the roots of these plants will have root nodules so the root nodules are like pouches which will harbor or which will uh, give shelter to rhizobium bacteria and how this rhizobium bacteria will help the plant by converting the atmospheric nitrogen into usable form plant cannot take the nitrogen which is readily available in the air so this rhizobium bacteria will help the plant to take the nitrogen by converting it into usable form and how the plant helping uh, rhizobium bacteria it helps by giving shelter i told you rhizobium bacteria is present in the root nodules of the leguminous plants so these root nodules are like pouches they are giving shelter to the rhizobium bacteria and in turn the rhizobium bacteria is preparing food for the not food it is uh, um, giving it nitrogen in a usable form okay in this way both uh, rhizobium bacteria as well as the leguminous plant are in a symbiotic relationship where in both are helping each other both are benefited by each other the plant is getting nitrogen in usable form and bacteria is uh, getting shelter this is called symbiotic nutrition chain example rhizobium and leguminous plants one more example is lichen it is the association of algae and fungi as you know algae are green in color so algae will prepare food and fungi will give shelter to the algae in this way they are mutually benefited from each other now let us have a quick summary of what we have learned children we yesterday and today we have learned what is photosynthesis and what are the types of nutrition autotrophic nutrition and heterotrophic nutrition autotrophic nutrition is a type of nutrition where organisms prepare their own food heterotrophic nutrition is a type of nutrition where the organisms cannot prepare food on their own structure of stomata and activities we have also seen activities to prove that carbon dioxide sunlight and chlorophyll are essential for photosynthesis and one more activity to show that oxygen is released during photosynthesis and different types of heterotrophic nutrition what are the different types of heterotrophic nutrition parasitic nutrition saprophytic nutrition insectivorous plants and symbiotic nutrition thank you children